four or five families in a country village was all the inspiration Jane Austen needed for her masterpieces. For novelist Sarah Waters, the boundaries of her latest novel extend little beyond a single household in South London. But while the landscape she depicts may be deliberately restricted, the preoccupations of her characters' lives are anything but parochial. I know all I need to know about you. You're like me. You showed it last night and you're showing it now. You hunger for your own sex. You hunger for the pleasure I can give you, don't you? Yes. Waters is best known for what she herself has called her lesbo-Victorian romps, like Tipping the Velvet, which was turned into a TV series. But after setting three novels in the Victorian era and two in the 1940s, her most recent turns to the period immediately after the First World War for literary inspiration. Almost the moment she left the tram, she was approached by another ex-soldier, this one more ragged than the last. He limped along beside her, holding out a canvas bag, telling her the details of his military record. In The Paying Guests, Frances and her mother, bereft by the war, are forced to make ends meet by taking in lodgers at their house in Champion Hill. The novel's heroine finds herself drawn to one of them, a married woman. There had been no declaration, only a glance, a pressing of fingers. If there were a man and a girl, it would be different. There would be less confusion and blur. She would seize Lillian's hand and Lillian would know what it meant. She herself would know what it meant. But they were not a man and a girl. They were two women, with clipping heels, and one of them was in a white dress which the moon set glowing like a beacon. But the clandestine affair takes a violent turn with tragic consequences. I spoke to Sarah Waters at the bandstand in the South London Park where her two central characters first kindled their romance. I started by asking her why she'd chosen the 1920s as her historical backdrop. Well, really, because I'd, it was the bit of history that I had never explored before and didn't know much about. Um, and I went there, really, with all sorts of um, stereotypes, I suppose, about flappers and really not knowing very much. And what I discovered was that the decade as a whole, but particularly the early part of the decade, the novel is set in 1922, was a much more complex and really a darker time, than I think, than we give it credit for. You know, still very much in the shadow of the First World War, a sort of exhausted, unhappy time time with lots of social tensions in it, um, a time actually not unlike our own period, I think. There is a party in the book, but there aren't any flappers at the party, are there? No, there aren't. Um, the party takes place in Clapham in a very, very ordinary house. And one of the things I wanted to do with the novel was to get beyond um, the surface of the stories we have about the 1920s that tend to be rather high society stories and to look for more modest stories, more suburban stories for working class life for lower middle class life. Well, you've described some of your previous novels as lesbo-Victorian romps. <laughs> so how do you describe this one? Oh, gosh, I don't know. It's kind of a lesbian love story that veers into melodrama. It's essentially a love story um, that's complicated by a very dramatic incident that kind of pushes its main characters into a real moral dilemma. So by the end of the book, you know, they've, they've been through my, my heroines, Frances and Lillian, they've been through quite an ordeal. You described Tipping the Velvet as a story that was told in a way that was half authentic but half anachronistic. And I suppose I saw a parallel with this in that you, you go along reading it thinking that perhaps the heroine is going to have an affair with her male lodger, but she ends up having a lesbian love affair. Is there a sense in which you're playing with the reader in that same way? Yes, I mean, I've often described Tipping the Velvet as a fantasy lesbian history. It's the kind of lesbian history that I wish lesbians had. <laughs> um, you know, we have lots of evidence about lesbian life in the past, but certainly in the 19th century and earlier, it tends to be in the form of hints and glimpses. And you have to, in a way, it's very liberating for a novelist because you can fill in the gaps. You're at liberty to fill in those gaps, to make it up. By the time you move into the 20th century, there's a lot more evidence about lesbian life. Um, so writing about the 20s, there was certainly material I could draw on from, from diaries and letters and memoirs. Um, but essentially, yeah, the love affair between Francis and Lillian, it was me wanting to kind of sort of, sort of say, you know, take on suburban 20s London and, and put lesbian fashion into it because, of course, it was there too. And, of course, The Paying Guests is set before the welfare state was created and you can really see people were sort of slipping, there was no safety net. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's one of the things that really struck me when I was researching the novel. Um, was, you know, it was a time of dire poverty for some people. I mean, Virginia Woolf talks about seeing 
people on the street in rags um, or people with sort of hunger etched into their faces. Um, and it reminds us how, how, how things changed for working people in the 20th century with the introduction of, of the welfare state and the NHS. And what it also reminds us is that you know, some of those things are now being dismantled. We don't see people in rags anymore, thank goodness, on the street, but, but you know, food banks, um, welfare cuts, um, the sort of punitive measures that are being introduced against poor people. Um, I think it's, very, it's really worrying, you know, it's really worrying. There seems a bit of a vogue at the moment for the very big, grand novel with the global perspective. The Paying Guests focuses on a very particular area of London, a very particular culture. Is that something that you think you're sort of slightly um, against the trend? Well, I think we live in what feels like a very urgent historical moment, don't we? You know, a time of threats, climate change, terrorism, international tensions. So it's not surprising that big books that seem to be addressing and exploring that moment are in demand and are popular. But actually, one of the things that startled me about the early 20s um, was how, how similar that period was to our period now. You know, it had come out of the, the First World War, the Paris Peace Conference showed what a sort of tangle Europe and, and the Middle East and elsewhere were, a tangle of um, political interests and resentments and grudges. Um, opening the paper in 1922, you would have just seen one sort of conflict after another, and the world did feel very dangerous and very newly unsafe. Sarah Waters, thank you very much. Thank you.